uh, and um, please take it away. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Chair of the closing session uh, of this of this particular session, uh, Dr. Godwin Marunga, uh, my Ndugu, as I uh, always fondly refer to you. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome uh, to this uh, session. And um, I will uh, leave my video running for a few minutes, but I have to switch it off because uh, uh, I'm on, uh, on battery power, haven't lost uh, electricity uh, some moments ago. Um, and, and I guess to conserve some of that battery power, I'll create the indulgence uh, of you and uh, of all the participants uh, to be able to speak off camera, uh, but hoping that I'll be as audible and as clear as possible um, under the circumstances. Uh, let me also uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Adeshina, uh, but also yourself uh, from Cordesia uh, and the colleagues at uh, UNRIST um, alongside the Sachi Chair uh, um, of Social Policy, which um, uh, Jimmy Adeshina leads uh, in uh, at UNISA uh, for the kind invitation extended to me to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, it has been a very a veritable festival over the last uh, three days. Uh, I had occasion or opportunities to uh, tune in uh, to some of the sessions and some of the uh, presentations, um, highly educative uh, and insightful. Uh, and I imagine that what I'll be saying uh, in this uh, closing uh, substantive session of the uh, three days uh, intellectual in Daba will really be more of uh, building on what has already been said, uh, as well as um, work which has been done uh, over the years, not least uh, by UNRIST and uh, by uh, Jimmy Adeshina and colleagues uh, who have been very active in the domain of uh, building our knowledge uh, and understanding uh, of the imperatives of social policy um, in the making uh, of uh, the modern state system. Um, and uh, in doing so, um, I, preparatory to this um, uh, presentation, uh, had occasion to revisit some of the uh, writings, recent writings uh, of colleagues of the likes of uh, uh, Yusuf Bangura, of Shiva Bunwari, uh, uh, and uh, even outside of the African continent, looking at um, uh, comparative uh, insights uh, that have emerged around the topic uh, from Asia and Latin America. Uh, some quite interesting work uh, on the Brazilian experience. Uh, and I would, uh, I would assume uh, that these uh, pioneering uh, efforts, uh, particularly the, the book on uh, social policy, which was uh, compiled uh, by Yusuf Bangura, published in 2007, uh, with uh, studies from various parts of the world, uh, offer us a good basis on which to build, uh, and in so doing to interrogate uh, particularly the African continental experience on which I propose uh, to focus uh, in this presentation. Uh, and my starting point is, is, is probably also my conclusion, uh, which is the basic proposition. I don't think it will be controversial uh, that if Africa's experience experiment with uh, democratization uh, is to evolve uh, to a point of uh, sustainability or what uh, students of democracy sometimes refer to as consolidation, um, uh, the social policy component uh, of uh, the African developmental experience uh, will have to be strengthened uh, and made a core part uh, of the efforts at building uh, democratic uh, governance uh, on the continent. Um, and as I said, I don't think this will be in itself uh, anything that will be controversial. But let me unpack that conclusion uh, and work my way uh, backwards uh, by taking us uh, to um, the period uh, three decades or more ago uh, 
when the current transition to democratization uh, began uh, on the African continent. And many of us will recall that that process, um, beginning with the um, movements, uh, popular protests that enveloped um, uh, the Republic of Bene, uh, often cited as the uh, trigger point uh, of what uh, some have referred to as Africa's entry into the third wave uh, of global democratization. Um, the popular protests in Bene were to uh, become both symbolic uh, and serve as a trigger uh, of, that, of that transitional process uh, from an authoritarian um, uh, era uh, into a new uh, phase of political evolution uh, on the continent. Um, but it came against the backdrop, and it needs to be emphasized, uh, of more than uh, two decades of economic crisis and structural adjustment uh, on the African continent. Um, economic crisis, which uh, began on the back uh, of uh, a payments uh, uh, problem, the problem of balance of payments, which in itself was also um, compounded by an external debt crisis uh, the 1982 so-called Mexican weekend, uh, when Mexico defaulted uh, on its loan repayments, and uh, that default uh, creating a contagion effect uh, that was to envelop uh, much of the global uh, financial system uh, and set in motion um, a series of panic uh, uh, measures uh, by key financial players, uh, which in turn refracted itself into the African continent um, as a problem of uh, external debt servicing uh, that became generalized over time uh, beyond a balance of payments problem uh, to a broader economic crisis. Um, that crisis became uh, the foundation on which uh, structural adjustment uh, made its entry into the African policy space. Um, underwritten by the IMF and the World Bank, going way beyond the initial austerity measures which African countries had themselves initiated uh, in response to the early days of the economic crisis that confronted them, and which by definition was supposed to be a more holistic um, intervention aimed at uh, carrying out a complete economic reset uh, and recalibration. Um, the thrust of the adjustment programs, as we uh, all know and will recall, indeed, we are still living with structural adjustment, even if the name uh, itself uh, may have changed over time. But the thrust of the adjustment programs was, by definition, also deflationary, um, given the, uh, um, the, the neoliberal uh, foundations on which um, they were conceived. Uh, and they culminated uh, in a determined effort uh, to undertake a retrenchment of the state and along with it, whatever was available or left of the social policy of the state. And I think it's important for us uh, to keep this point in mind uh, about not just uh, simply a determined, even doctrinaire um, uh, uh, effort uh, under the rubric of structural adjustment to cut the state post-colonial states down to size um, and limit it to what um, Pandika in his days uh, referred to as the night watchman role, um, uh, simply uh, providing uh, basic uh, security um, uh, for citizens and for investors in particular, uh, but uh, otherwise uh, leaving the terrain to the so-called free forces of the market. Um, and this actually went hand in hand uh, with um, a retrenchment of uh, uh, social policy, uh, some of which actually uh, comprised an important part of the gains of the post-colonial period, of the gains of independence. Uh, social policy measures uh, coming in various forms and shapes in which many uh, African governments, as they achieved independence, uh, invested heavily uh, from the health sector to the educational sector, but even to broader institutions of, um, uh, of, of uh, economic and, uh, and, and social development that may not have been defined specifically or explicitly as performing uh, a social policy function, but which in fact were multitasked institutions uh, that became part and parcel of the broader fabric uh, 
of social cohesion and uh, of the kinds of progress and mobility that characterized the first uh, uh, decade or two uh, of, of independence. Uh, and it was uh, um, uh, this complex of uh, social policy interventions of the early post-colonial period um, that uh, the IMF World Bank Structural Adjustment Programs uh, particularly uh, targeted uh, for uh, dismantling alongside the retrenchment uh, of the state. Uh, the consequences of uh, the structural adjustment years were uh, multifaceted, they are very familiar. I'm not going to dwell too much on them, uh, except to note, um, particularly in conversation uh, with the writings of Sheila Bunwari and uh, Yusuf Bangura and others, uh, that um, one immediate consequence was the deindustrialization uh, of African economies um, uh, and on the back of it, uh, a massive uh, problem of unemployment, um, the dissemination of uh, the historic middle class of the post-colonial period um, and so on and so forth. Uh, consequences which basically added up uh, in the context of the attempts uh, to balance budgets, uh, cut the public expenditure including particularly the social expenditure of the state, introduce cost recovery uh, measures, um, uh, basically a metaphor for an increase in the uh, price of social services that were still uh, available uh, and user fees and, and all of the uh, language that was invented uh, by the IMF and the World Bank to push through uh, their agenda of uh, the retrenchment of the state and of social policy. Uh, but all of this culminated in uh, an expansion in the boundaries of poverty uh, and uh, a rapid uh, expansion uh, in inequality uh, across uh, many of uh, the countries of Africa uh, as the adjustment years uh, progressed. And in order to enforce adjustment, again, uh, an issue which those of us uh, who have studied this period uh, in Africa's history would recall that in order to enforce adjustment, um, uh, which was supposed to be uh, a rational set of uh, policies, the way it was marketed, that was good for uh, Africans and for African countries. Um, uh, there was really no hesitation in resorting to a range of uh, authoritarian political regimes, uh, beginning first with the uh, conditionality and cross-conditionality clauses of the IMF and the World Bank, um, supported by um, bilateral donors uh, and even uh, private uh, uh, creditors uh, organized in the uh, London club, um, basically copying uh, their Paris club counterparts, uh, working in tandem with the IMF and the World Bank to create conditionality and cross-conditionality clauses that were authoritarian by definition and were defined essentially to compel African countries uh, uh, to embrace structural adjustment, leaving them essentially with absolutely no alternative uh, than uh, the embrace of structural adjustment. Um, and as regimes embraced structural adjustment and came against uh, domestic resistance uh, and opposition, including from uh, trade unions and from a range of social movements and uh, civil society groups uh, that began to flourish uh, at the time. Uh, intellectual resistance also coming from the African Academy, but uh, also um, sites like the United Nations Economic uh, Commission for Africa. Uh, in the face of such resistance, we simply saw a strengthening domestic governance uh, processes. Um, very much, I think, in line with the prediction which was made by the chief economist of the Africa Development Department of the World Bank at the time, uh, in certain Deepak Lal, uh, who, to quote him, uh, said that effective, ruthless governments able to ride roughshod on, on public opinion were absolutely necessary for the successful implementation uh, of uh, structural adjustment uh, measures. So governments confronted with domestic opposition, uh, the phenomenon of the IMF riots uh, 
uh, of the 1980s uh, that spread across uh, the continent as adjustment measures were in enforced uh, and which even resulted in the collapse of uh, a few governments. Some might remember the fall of uh, uh, Nomeri uh, of, of uh, President Nomeri of Sudan uh, was uh, a direct result of the anti-IMF riots um, uh, that uh, enveloped uh, Khartoum uh, and other major cities of the country and paved the way for um, a military coup d'etat uh, to replace him. But also places like Egypt in Cairo, where following an IMF mission and an increase in the price of bread, um, widespread opposition and protests uh, gave the Mubarak regime at the time a first taste uh, of uh, what was later to become, I think, uh, the uh, Arab Spring uh, that brought uh, about the fall uh, of that government. Uh, so IMF riots became ubiquitous uh, across the continent, suppressed by uh, governments that were themselves laboring under the weight of uh, conditionality and cross-conditionality clauses in order to appear uh, to be uh, faithful uh, to the goals of structural adjustment uh, and therefore be able to access uh, loans and uh, uh, relief uh, 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 capital uh, offered to them by the IMF uh, and the risk handling of debts by the Paris and uh, London clubs, uh, creating a vicious cycle, uh, as it were, um, that effectively meant um, a new round uh, of uh, repression uh, over and above what military regime uh, and single party rule uh, may have meant, uh, as this also became the vogue uh, across the continent uh, from the late 60s. Uh, through uh, much of the 1970s. Um, and this all of the political instability, of course, was also uh, the organization uh, by uh, various um, uh, movements, uh, both openly and underground trade unions, uh, students' associations, students' unions, um, various women's groups, uh, basically contesting uh, the authority of uh, uh, increasingly uh, uh, draconian uh, and unrepresentative governments um, and resulting in the manifestations which we saw in Cotonou uh, sustained over weeks uh, on end, uh, demanding an end to single party and military rule and the opening up of uh, the political space. Um, the resistance to structural adjustments uh, effectively became the harbinger of the uh, emergence of um, democracy movements uh, that effectively ushered Africa uh, into the uh, so-called global third wave of, of democratization. Uh, and a lot of hope was placed uh, on, uh, on this transition. Uh, uh, you might remember that some commentators uh, particularly uh, uh, enjoy citing Colin Legum in this regard, uh, because he's somebody who um, from early on uh, had made um, uh, uh, investments of intellectual effort in tracking political developments on the continent uh, in the period from late colonialism right up to uh, the 1990s when these uh, demonstrations uh, resulted in the fall of uh, long established single party uh, and military governments. Uh, Colin Legum celebrating uh, what was happening, uh, the transition that was underway as nothing less than a second liberation. Um, on the argument that in the first liberation was uh, Africa's freedom uh, from uh, colonial rule, uh, the second liberation was the beginning of freedom uh, from authoritarian uh, government uh, across, uh, the, across the continent. Uh, and, and the hope that this might be the beginning of a new phase that will usher in uh, representative government of a kind that would be accountable uh, to the populace uh, and able also uh, to formulate uh, policies that will be um, responsive uh, to the uh, internal dynamics of uh, many of the countries of the continent. Uh, the champions of the uh, protests against uh, authoritarian uh, governance were themselves very careful to insist uh, in a lot of cases, and that translated itself into the sovereign national conferences which we saw uh, 
uh, to insist that uh, it was not going to be uh, simply a matter of cosmetic changes uh, in the administration of public affairs, um, but rather a wholesale uh, restructuring uh, of uh, the political system uh, in order to ensure that empowered citizens are able to occupy uh, the driver's seat. Uh, and so through the sovereign national conferences, uh, we saw a whole host of initiatives ranging from a rewriting of constitutions um, in some of the best examples uh, to um, uh, the um, reconstitution of uh, the electoral system, uh, including uh, the enabling of uh, autonomous uh, election management bodies, um, the licensing of uh, a new multi-party uh, political order uh, to underpin the new system of uh, or the reinstated system of electoral pluralism, uh, rules about the opening up uh, of uh, spaces uh, for citizen participation, the right to demonstrate, the right to assembly, the right to association, um, and uh, all of which fed into um, a period of efflorescence uh, in civil society life uh, across the continent during the 1990s uh, and beyond. Um, and, and I think the early signs that came uh, from the transition uh, would, would have perhaps suggested to many uh, that uh, Africa may uh, have finally made a qualitative break uh, with the authoritarian past. Um, as we began to see an alternation of power, uh, long ruling, um, uh, live presidencies replaced uh, through popular elections uh, by a new set of actors uh, who came uh, to occupy the center stage um, as electoral pluralism uh, threw up uh, one surprise after uh, the other. Um, uh, I guess for many of us, uh, the um, voting out of the United National Independence Party uh, of uh, Kenneth Kaunda uh, in Zambia uh, was perhaps symbolic uh, of the kinds of shifts that were to take place uh, in many other uh, countries of the continent, uh, both as long ruling uh, presidents and ruling parties or military dictatorships. Uh, or indeed even diarchical uh, military civilian arrangements uh, that dominated power gave way in most places uh, to a new set of political actors um, uh, brought into power on the strength of uh, uh, an electoral pluralism uh, that also showed signs of strengthening itself uh, over time. Um, uh, sometimes I think to a point where issues of electoral integrity uh, that had previously been uh, a major concern of citizens uh, appeared uh, in some instances uh, to become to to to, to uh, become something of uh, of the past. Um, I'll cite here the notable example of Ghana, where the quality of elections, uh, uh, you know, improved significantly from one electoral cycle uh, to the other. Uh, and uh, at the third or fourth level, uh, instances of the emergence of uh, what uh, in international idea we used to refer to as programmatic political parties. Uh, parties built on the basis of uh, a clear program of action uh, and anchored uh, in some instances on a broad ideological orientation as against uh, the parties of old that were dominated by personalities um, and which uh, basically functioned uh, with little or no uh, programmatic agenda or vision of societal transformation uh, to speak of. So broadly speaking, this, this, this seems to be um, uh, uh, a process of transition uh, that set Africa on the right path, uh, as it were. But it was really not uh, too many years after, um, even before the dawn, uh, of the new millennium, that we began to see many of the discontents associated with the system of electoral pluralism um, that was instituted on the back of the transitions uh, of the early 1990s. Um, and here, I think it's important for us uh, to reconnect back to the issues of uh, governance, 
uh, and social policy. It's important for us uh, to interrogate why uh, by the uh, end of the first decade of the transitions, um, uh, Africans began to feel uh, that the democracy in which they had invested so much uh, did not seem to be capable of delivering uh, any of uh, the key dividends um, uh, of uh, improvements in livelihoods, uh, of uh, advancement, um, uh, of, of, of mobility, uh, and uh, of overall uh, citizen well-being uh, and empowerment. Uh, and, and, and this question important uh, to put side by side uh, with the fact that even on the issues of a technical nature, such as the alternation of power or the integrity of elections, we also began to witness significant setbacks. Um, uh, setbacks which manifested themselves uh, by the first decade uh, of the new millennium uh, in the abandonment of term limitation, for example, uh, and uh, attempts by several uh, uh, presidents, incumbents, uh, in not less than uh, 13 African countries by the end of the first decade of the new millennium, um, uh, basically wanting to stay in office, uh, hold on to power indefinitely, uh, and doing away with the term limitation. That was an important element uh, of the citizen uh, rejection uh, of life presidencies uh, that had uh, uh, been at the heart of some of the conversations uh, in negotiating a new post-authoritarian uh, order uh, on the continent. Um, in this, by the same token, we saw election management bodies increasingly undermined, or in some cases, their leadership compromising their independence uh, and throwing up uh, the uh, familiar uh, questions of uh, fraud in the electoral process uh, of the kind which basically um, undermines the credibility uh, of the electoral process. Uh, and I can cite many other examples of the failings of the democratic transition, um, even on the terms on which it was uh, unfolded in the 1990s. Um, not to talk of other components um, that can be summarized under the rubric of the dividends of democracy uh, in the social and the economic domain, um, which seems to have eluded uh, most, uh, most governments, um, in spite of the fact that alternation of power uh, continued to take place uh, in at least a significant number of uh, countries on the continent. Uh, first and foremost in this regard, I think, is for us to remember that many of the elected governments came into office um, with the expectation, uh, at least from the Bretton Woods institutions, that they would use their newly acquired legitimacy to continue to push the agenda of structural adjustment, which by definition was an agenda of deflation and austerity. And here, therefore, uh, we are confronted with a situation in which elected governments, regardless of what political party uh, they represented, regardless of what alternation of power may take place from one region to the other across the electoral cycle, were basically stuck with the same set of social and economic policies, um, no longer referred to as structural adjustment, but bearing all of the hallmarks uh, of a neoliberal program of adjustment uh, uh, around which they were expected uh, to function uh, and for which many of them uh, really had little or no alternative. Um, this is in fact the paradox that led uh, Tandikam Kandawiri to describe Africa's new democracies as essentially choiceless democracies. Democracies in which citizens on the basis of promises of politicians um, vote parties into power and alternate power between one party and the other, between one incumbent and the other, uh, even voting in historic opposition parties into office or finding themselves essentially stuck with the same set of policies, uh, social and economic policies that basically reinforced poverty uh, and inequality um, across much of the continent. This choicelessness. Uh, um, uh, that 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 Andika referred to 
I think um, underscores uh, also the absence of um, uh, autonomous policy spaces for social and economic uh, decision making by elected government in Africa, um, functioning in a lot of cases uh, under direct and indirect uh, external agencies of restraint uh, and unable uh, in a lot of cases uh, to um, uh, uh, produce the kinds of economic and social policies that we would normally describe as heterodox policies. And I would like to come back to this uh, a bit later on, um, the relationship between democracy uh, and heterodoxy uh, in the policy process. Uh, but certainly in the African context, elected government uh, became the enforcer of an old orthodoxy uh, that ran in the face even of the goals of the consolidation of democracy, let alone the questions of the advancement of the welfare of a citizenry uh, that had seen its social and economic uh, lot decimated uh, for almost three decades continuously, uh, beginning from the late uh, early 1980s uh, through into the new millennium. Um, effectively, therefore, we also found a situation in which um, as our democratic journey uh, progressed, as the rituals of elections took place, um, uh, poverty, unemployment, um, uh, inequality uh, became essentially the drivers of a broad disempowerment uh, of citizens. Uh, a disempowerment which effectively meant that citizens uh, became um, uh, vulnerable uh, to a whole host uh, of discontents uh, in the political system. Uh, vulnerability to the godfathers of so-called democratic politics who were able to buy the vote, uh, including outrightly buying vo voters' cards um, uh, as to effectively uh, disempower the electorate. Um, a disempowerment which uh, manifested itself uh, in the course of uh, the first decade of the new millennium um, uh, uh, and led to several commentators uh, to note that increasingly elections in Africa amounted to exercises in voting without choosing. Voting without choosing. We go through the rituals of voting, but in actual fact, we are not exercising much choice uh, in the electoral process not only because of the choicelessness um, which Tandika and Kandawiro observed uh, with Africa's new democracies um, in, the, in, 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 his, um, in his writings um, uh, uh, summarizing the African uh, experience of democratization, uh, but also in terms of the fact that citizens went into the electoral process essentially as disempowered uh, individuals who were uh, basically um, uh, cannon fodder for uh, political gladiators uh, in a context of massive disempowerment uh, in which the votes really was essentially for sale uh, to the highest bidder in a lot of cases. Um, for the Nigerians who are in this conversation, you'll be familiar with the notion of the stomach infrastructure that was used uh, to capture this situation of citizen disempowerment of terribly impoverished, even um, uh, citizens living in a state of uh, uh, immiseration uh, on a scale never before experienced, uh, and therefore uh, vulnerable uh, to all of the, um, uh, uh, <laughs> any manner that was thrown in their direction, um, comprising bags of rice or um, basic uh, household commodities, uh, made available to the electorate on the eve of voting uh, and effectively buying the conscience uh, of uh, the voting population. Uh, and in the context of all of this, we also see the opening up uh, of uh, the um, social and political space uh, to the entry of a range of other actors um, outside of the state. Um, as such, uh, with a state that was increasingly absent, uh, crime and criminality, uh, an underground economy, openness to radicalization, um, as is often referred to in the literature, um, a radicalization uh, 
uh, that spoke of uh, a new um, era of extremism uh, uh, in which um, vulnerable citizens for as little as uh, the equivalent of $5 are recruited into the ranks of various insurgency groups, um, including those of them uh, proclaiming a peculiar interpretation of Islam such as Boko Haram uh, and constituting the fighting force uh, uh, of, of, of such insurgency movements um, uh, in search of a new uh, meaning uh, within uh, the political space uh, of uh, the emergence of militias uh, of various kinds, uh, of uh, violence uh, of a xenophobic nature um, side by side with a resurgence in ethno-regional uh, identities um, uh, and, and uh, extremit extremities of a kind that also challenge the idea and the ideal of the secular uh, nation state uh, project of the, uh, of the independence period, uh, as well as gender-based violence, uh, which we also, uh, from all of the documented evidence, uh, have seen grown by leaps and bounds uh, from decade after decade uh, in the period since the uh, onset uh, of uh, uh, democratic uh, transition in the, 19, uh, in the early 1990s. So basically, we uh, are inheritors of, uh, uh, of, of a process and a system uh, in which we have attempted to build uh, democratic governance uh, but to do so on the basis of a minimalist state uh, and a state that itself um, uh, is completely uh, or increasingly absent uh, from uh, the social arena. Um, and I say this despite the fact that uh, initiatives of various kinds um, from the you know, MDGs, poverty reduction strategy papers, uh, the current generation of uh, uh, cash transfer uh, initiatives uh, that have been introduced by various governments uh, to try to alleviate uh, poverty uh, and, and outright misery uh, amongst uh, the, 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 the citizens. Um, um, that all of these initiatives undertaken um, uh, have not really in any meaningful way uh, addressed the question of the role of the state uh, and the importance of uh, a social state uh, in the consolidation of a democratic uh, agenda uh, for the countries uh, of the continent. Um, and uh, uh, to the extent to which they have worked, uh, they comprise uh, palliative measures that are too, too little, um, miserable in their, in their, in their, in their, in their in their content and miserly in terms of what they offer. Um, in South Africa, where um, the Sachitja is located, um, uh, we talk of about uh, 350 rands uh, in cash transfers. Um, uh, and in other uh, jurisdictions, uh, that, 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 that amount is even much lower uh, when uh, uh, compared to uh, the 350 rands in terms of uh, uh, current exchange rates, um, amounts which really uh, uh, do not make any dent of uh, a significant kind uh, in the levels of poverty, of uh, immiseration, of uh, exclusion, uh, and which I think should warn us to the fact that to the extent to which Africa might be able um, to consolidate uh, a system of democratic governance. Um, uh, the challenge which confronts us today is one of ensuring uh, that the democratic project is built not just on the mechanics of elections and of constitution making, but on a social pact, on a social pact which uh, puts the social expenditure of the state as a central component of citizen empowerment understanding that empowered citizens also make for a functioning electoral uh, and constitutional process uh, of the kind that will bring about the integrity, the accountability, and the representation uh, which, we, which we wish to see in our political systems. Uh, a social pact uh, 
will also be an important component of the rebuilding of social cohesion uh, in most of our countries in the context of um, the extreme poverty and inequality uh, to which I have referred and all of the negative consequences uh, in uh, a revival of xenophobia, of ethno-regional policy, politics of religious extremism, uh, and so on and so forth, banditry um, and criminality of various kinds um, uh, 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 that we currently live with and which basically underwrites uh, what some have referred to as the new citizen season of anony uh, uh, with which we are confronted. So looking forward in terms of our quest for an alternative, my, my claim, my argument is that Africa's quest uh, for democratic consolidation can certainly not have content and meaning if it is bereft of a social compact, of a social component, um, which in terms of what we know of what works and what does not work by way of good practices of a comparative nature from around the world will be a social pact that is anchored on a universality that makes it possible um, for different categories uh, of citizens uh, to be able to build a new sense of national identity and belonging um, without fear of stigma or discrimination. Uh, in the enjoyment of their rights. Um, and I would like to propose that in terms of our own uh, research agenda and policy dialogues, uh, these are issues which we need to bring to the fore of conversations um, as a way out of our city season uh, of anony. Uh, the temptation in some instances to resort to um, a return to military rule, as we have seen uh, in parts of West Africa, uh, may provide temporary feeling of relief uh, for the populace. Um, but whether military, uh, authoritarian rule, or elected uh, government that is bereft of a social anchorage, um, we will in fact uh, be confronted with the same problems of anony uh, unless we rethink our uh, uh, systems and processes uh, of democratic governance in a manner that will ensure that the empowerment of citizens becomes the primary purpose of whatever reforms that are undertaken. Uh, and I'm not unaware, of course, that um, the uh, basic economic conditions for the promotion of a socially pacted democratic system of governance um, is, is an important um, one to which uh, we need to pay attention. Uh, my comfort in this regard is essentially that the same reasons that make it impossible for us to have robust social policies as part of the ongoing processes uh, of democratization are also those same reasons that make it impossible uh, for most African countries to develop meaningful uh, trade and industrial policies of the kind that can un unleash economic potentialities um, and enhance domestic uh, value addition uh, through beneficiation, for example, of natural resources uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we are dealing with the same basic uh, challenge uh, of policy uh, and of the choices which are made uh, by uh, those who hold power um, as part of a broad uh, transnational uh, power coalition um, that is bent on enforcing um, a global system uh, of uh, neoliberalism um, in the administration of uh, public affairs. Uh, and here, I think for those of us uh, who uh, follow the conversation, uh, the, 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 the issues which are joined uh, in the struggle that we are confronted with are fairly straightforward. Um, the agenda of ensuring that politics and social policy are disciplined to the demands of so-called rational economics is still an ongoing agenda. And nobody put it better than Larry Somers, uh, democratic politician, by the way, uh, in terms of his affiliation in the United States, not a Republican, was certainly one of the best exponents of this global neoliberal agenda when he argued as chief economist and vice president of the World Bank that 
economists know what it takes to grow an economy. And they have developed the rational set of policy interventions required to sustain economic growth over a long run. What they have not yet succeeded in doing, but which they must do for the sake of rationality in policy making, is to ensure that politics doesn't mess things up. In other words, there's still a push, as it were, for politics, regardless of the pluralism that underpins it, to produce only an orthodox outcome. Whereas, in fact, democratic politics, if it functioned properly in any system, in any society, regardless of the level of development, should, in fact, be the propeller of heterodoxy in policy making as different interest groups in interaction with one another attempt to forge out compromises of a kind that would ensure that at least a majority of the populace are able to line up behind a consensus that is agreed upon for a season. And it is, I think, again here that we need to begin to insist in our arguments that democratic politics is not about uniformizing either political life or social and economic policy, but of producing what in the old Maoist language, a situation in the public sphere where a thousand flowers can bloom, interact with one another freely and produce the kinds of mixes of policy that at least will ensure that we are able to proceed on the basis of an heterodox agenda as opposed to an enforced orthodoxy that basically might mean the collapse of um, the current uh, nation state project in many of the countries of our continent. I thank you again for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts uh, with you uh, and uh, look forward if the time permits and the chair allows uh, to a short conversation uh, around uh, the views which I have uh, presented before you. Thank you very much, Chair, and back to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lukashi, and uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, um, um, I, I, I can't find the correct word, but this is really a, a, a serious and rigorous survey uh, of the story of the what you described as the minimalist state, uh, one that uh, by forces external to it and internal to it has been forced to vacate uh, spaces of economic policy making, spaces of social policy making, uh, and has ceded ground uh, in many ways uh, due to a variety of, uh, uh, of influences uh, to a new politics that promotes uh, let's use the word, uh, <laughs> the democratization of disempowerment, if you will, uh, going back uh, to the favorite phrase uh, that the late uh, Professor Claude Ake uh, wrote about so eloquently. Uh, I don't think that uh, I qualify to say any more on this rather than to thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent, um, committed, uh, and uh, indeed uh, provocative but inspiring presentation. Uh, I think I have um, a, a few minutes for a few different questions, uh, even though I can see we're running short of time, but I'll try to manage it in such a way that uh, the final uh, segment with the farewell address uh, can also have its time. So if there is anyone who has a, a quick question, uh, if you want to use the Q&A in the, in the Zoom system, or if you want to raise up your hand and we can uh, pick you out, I think that uh, we, we have a minute, uh, some time for us to do this. Uh, anyone with a question? Anyone with a comment? Uh, I can see Ayo. Uh, can we give her, can we give, can we all? Few time in that order, Ayo. Yes, please. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Professor Alvaro, for this very elaborative uh, lecture. I have one particular question, so I just want to hear your opinion on this issue. Uh, in a context where we have uh, a fundamental power imbalance between actors, both within and outside uh, the continent, which promote this orthodox political economic thinking practice, policy making and everything, the likes of the think tanks, the civil society organizations, and even academics in Africa. Where do you see that? I, I believe that everything that you, you, you argued for, I, I agree with it, but I, I still believe that all these ideas are very much on the margin. And I don't see, uh, so the challenge is how can we kind of mobilize to push the center and bring these ideas to, to the policymakers, the decision makers, to the politicians, and even populate these ideas into those practitioners or movement leaders in the think tanks, in the civil society, and the social movement. So I believe that's where probably the challenge is. And I wonder whether you have any comment on that. Thank you. Uh, can I also take the question from uh, the comment from Rich Sewer? Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, of course, thanks to Prof. Adebayo for this very, very insightful. My name is Richard Sewachidianga from the Center for Basic Research in Uganda. I think for me, the, the quick point I wanted to ask um, uh, Prof. Adebayo to really reflect on is this whole point which where we see a certain level of metamorphosis of leaders. Um, we know that several leaders in this continent have been, uh, you know, start off as very progressive and then they end up as totally regressive. Um, I, you know, throwing away the ideals, these four questions of social policy, and returning to issues around, uh, you know, autocracy, autocracy and, and militarism, and, and all those kinds of things. But, but I don't know if in your framing, this is something that you can locate around what is it that happens that sort of uh, allows for a backsliding of leaders, uh, in terms of their politics and their practice uh, as we go along, because I think that's uh, an area that we cannot explain, especially if you are from Uganda with a three-decade leader. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, I like the metamorphosis from Richard so Kirianga to Rich Sewa. Uh, it feels very rich. Uh, Lucas, you want to take on these two questions uh, and we'll see if we have time for another uh, after that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. We're all from Uganda and uh, I, I guess we're all trapped in this, <laughs> in this paradox. Uh, even, even if our experiences elsewhere on the continent are not as uh, dramatic as um, as uh, the 360 degrees uh, term uh, that you were all living witnesses of uh, in Uganda. Um, recall my point about uh, alternation of power, essentially producing what uh, Tandika described as the choicelessness. And I think here the um, reality is, is also that for a lot of governments, uh, for a lot of leaders uh, voted into office, um, they get very, very quickly uh, boxed into uh, very into narrow policy uh, spaces uh, of the kind which effectively uh, pull them away from what one might call the idealism on the basis of which they came into office, into a very narrow realism uh, for which I think for many, um, uh, it, it basically becomes a comfort zone. Uh, from which uh, they operate. Um, and, and the uh, imbalance, if one might call it, between the weight of the external agencies of restraint that uh, pile pressure uh, 
um, basically have hijacked the domestic policy space uh, and the voices uh, of organized uh, forces within the country uh, to push back uh, is one of those areas where we need uh, to pay uh, much greater attention. Um, doing so also with a recognition that in the period, for example, since the 80s, when we began a process of deindustrialization, de 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 we've seen a weakening uh, of traditional social movements, uh, of trade unions, for example, um, without a corresponding um, strengthening uh, of the kinds of organized uh, counter civil society weight that might be able uh, to fill the gap uh, vacated by our traditional students' union, uh, trade unions, uh, and various uh, other social movements that were at the heart of the fight against uh, military rule and authoritarianism, and which were able, in many instances, uh, to be the drivers of some of, some of the gains in social policy that we saw in the period after independence. Um, uh, students insisting, for example, on particular policies with regards to um, uh, the fees which are charged uh, for secondary and post-secondary education, uh, or trade unions being able to fight effectively for a decent wage, even before the concept itself became uh, 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 fashionable um, in international and ILO circles, uh, and so on and so forth, um, to be able to push a broader agenda, a broader agenda of a secular state project uh, that is uh, responsible and responsive uh, to uh, the members of, of, of society, um, to build boundaries uh, of solidarity um, of a kind which uh, also helps to strengthen social cohesion. We've seen a lot of that eroded uh, as part of um, uh, the project uh, of, of structural adjustment. Uh, and the consequences which it had. Um, and, and so being able to build countervailing forces um, domestically um, that will also become veritable sources of pressure uh, on those who come into office uh, and reduce their capacity to ride freely uh, on the back of some so-called international endorsement and legitimacy um, is, is one of the tasks which I think confronts us across the board uh, on the continent, uh, including Uganda. Um, and I think this connects with uh, Eyob's uh, question. Um, I think in many respects, Eyob, we have our work cut out for us. Um, it is true that much of what we say, in fact, much of what I have uh, said today, I have had occasion to present uh, before some of our, our leaders, um, whether at Tana Forum or um, at the retreats organized by the AU. Uh, and you'll be amazed how many of the uh, political leaders actually would nod in agreement uh, with some of the analysis. Um, and, and the question, I think, is again um, the way in which transnational power is organized and our capacity to be able to build countervailing uh, forces. Um, a development partner, so called, that seeks to influence the direction of policy uh, for a newly elected government in country X on the African continent comes with an aid package that also involves the supply of uh, policy advisory, advisory uh, personnel um, uh, who basically shape uh, the direction uh, of, 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 of the choices made uh, by such an elected government, a newly elected government in a particular way. Um, what I think uh, um, several institutions uh, on the continent uh, where there are progressive minded people are seeking to do, and also to take the results of research which we conduct beyond the realms of the academy into policy and political spaces with political parties, with uh, social movements, with elected government, uh, where the opportunity uh, is available in order to at least put on the table uh, the idea that there are alternatives and things can be done uh, differently. And to remind um, as many of our policymakers and political leaders as possible that um, many of those who present themselves 
uh, as uh, supporters with uh, an altruistic mission are actually nothing more than bad Samaritans. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a uh... Uh, there is one question that I would like to pick, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, 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 there is on the chat Q and A. Considering the cost of violent elections on lives and economics, what governance alternatives might we in Africa embrace? Is electoral democracy really for us? Um, another concerned Ugandan. Uh, that is what I have there. Uh, Bio, do you want to take on that? Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I would I would say that um, for better or for worse, uh, colleagues, I think we are condemned to democracy. Democracy is part of our broad consciousness as 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 uh, as human beings, um, and none of us would like to, if we had the choice, um, leave our lives under conditions of um, autocracy, of repression of uh, exclusion, of marginalization, uh, and still beat our chest that we feel able to say that we are part uh, and parcel of a political community uh, as citizens. Um, and uh, part of the struggle which we have waged as Africans uh, from time immemorial is in fact a struggle uh, precisely for this most basic and fundamental uh, of democratic uh, rights. Uh, the right to be, the right to belong, and the right to participate uh, in matters that concern us at home uh, and globally. Um, and uh, although um, uh, political gladiators in our current, uh, as in our previous efforts at democratization, uh, will often um, enact uh, episodes of violence um, uh, in order in, in their fight for power, um, I think this in itself uh, is not, in my view, an argument for an abandonment uh, of uh, the basic ideal of uh, democratization. Now, we can have a debate as to whether um, uh, the particular form of electoral pluralism, which we have uh, embraced uh, as part of uh, the so-called global third wave, uh, is itself uh, the most appropriate. Um, and, and I've, I've, I've using myself uh, to argue uh, that simply uh, promoting uh, a system of multi-party rule um, uh, politics without a proper anchorage of such uh, in a broader vision of societal transformation uh, can be uh, both irrelevant and in the worst cases, uh, irresponsible. Um, uh, democracy is not an invitation to uniformity um, and uh, building our own democracies out of our historical experiences uh, should in fact suggest that across the African continent, uh, we, we would be able uh, to devise uh, varieties uh, of democratic governance uh, of a kind which are responsive to the demands of citizens while simultaneously uh, being uh, open uh, to helping us to push our agenda of structural transformation uh, as, as a people. Uh, democracy needs to go with development um, and, uh, and our democratic system uh, will have to be anchored uh, also uh, on uh, that vision of structural transformation uh, that we hope uh, will be uh, the, the path uh, for lifting the bulk of our people uh, uh, out of uh, poverty uh, and, and misery of the kind which we are confronted with uh, today. But, uh, Thank you uh, very much uh, indeed uh, for, for the responses, but uh, also for the lecture. My apologies to anyone else who has a question. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time and uh, I would like to spare some 20 minutes for the closing uh, uh, session for the farewell addresses from uh, at least three speakers.
Uh, so uh, just to uh, again return my sincere word of thanks to Professor Debayo Rukoshi, uh, not only for accepting to join us uh, for this particular conference, but also for really dedicating the time, commitment, and energy uh, to speak directly to the theme of the conference and uh, to help us not just uh, remember uh, the memory of uh, the late Tandika Mkanda, but to also provoke us into uh, thinking uh, in line with the vision, with the ideas that uh, uh, Tandika not only led, but also actually inspired us uh, to think about. And really to uh, thank you also for uh, reinvigorating us into uh, remembering this, but also thinking about possible ways forward uh, in the analysis, not just of social policy, but actually in more specific terms, social policy uh, for a sustained democratic uh, governance. And I think uh, sitting behind your lecture is an invitation for us to commit to uh, a new struggle. Uh, because I feel that uh, you essentially have uh, indicated to us that there is almost a cyclical nature in the policy of those forces that uh, are detaining us uh, in many of the things that we want to do and advance the transformation of the continent. And perhaps what we need to do is to find uh, ways of breaking out of this cyclical uh, thing and begin to think uh, autonomously in terms of where we want to take the continent. So really, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we can pick up some of the uh, outstanding questions in other forums. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity, uh, therefore, to redirect uh, our attention to the farewell uh, addresses. Uh, the conference uh, that we've just had uh, is jointly organized uh, by uh, the Sachi Chair in Social Policy at the University uh, of South Africa. Uh, in collaboration with UNRIST in Geneva, and of course uh, with CODESRIA, for, for whom I'm the executive secretary. And uh, I don't want to come back again at the end to begin to uh, pass my own uh, uh, comments uh, as a final address. I'm going to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank uh, uh, the partners that we have worked with uh, in preparing for this conference. Uh, to thank uh, Jimmy Adeshina uh, Kaja Huyo for the work that uh, has gone into this. I know there is a whole team of colleagues um, working with uh, uh, Professor Jimmy Adeshina to make this a successful conference. Uh, some of them in Kodesria, some of them uh, in UNISA. Uh, this is really my, uh, my final word of uh, thank you for all the excellent work that has gone into this. But also indeed for the intellectual content uh, that uh, went into preparing the conference, but that has also been realized uh, through the various uh, interventions that we've had over the last three days. Uh, the, 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 the virtual platform isn't always the best uh, medium of doing this, but at least uh, we, we continue uh, to, 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 to do the best in terms of uh, highlighting uh, the issues that we need to be discussing going forward. So uh, really, uh, I am really, really humbled, but also really grateful and privileged uh, to have been associated with this. And on behalf of Codesia to have been in, you know, a part of the uh, agenda of this conference, but most importantly, to be able to remember 